the Army of Northern Virginia. I'd like to welcome you this afternoon to a demonstration of an 1861 2.9 inch Parrot rifle. Now we say 1861 because it wasn't that year that a man named Robert Parrot patented a technique for taking a great steel bar, bending it into a great ring, and then screwing the barrel inside so it's reinforced and will not explode when superheated during a battle. 2.9 inch is the bore, or the opening at the end, and it is called a rifle because the inside of the barrel is cut with grooves and ridges which cause the ordnance or ammunition to come out of that barrel spinning like a rifle bullet, which moves it more accurately to its target. As a matter of fact, a well-trained crew can put a shell through a space the size of a barn door at 1,900 yards, or just over a mile and an eighth. Doesn't come easy, comes with the training, but it can be done. Unfortunately, in our battle, we can only fire at what we can see. We do not know what's beyond those trees. We have no way of sending someone out there to say you are high or low or left or right. So we must depend on our own sight or the field glasses of our officers. How many of you have served in the military? Anybody here in the military? Well, as you know, if you can see what you are shooting at, what you are shooting at can probably see you. So we are frequently the preferred targets of our artillery counterparts on the other side. It flies out over above the enemy, explodes in the air above him, spreading pieces of itself in all directions. As the enemy grows even closer and we're opposing infantry, we might move to what's known as case shot. This is a hollow shell with balls in it made out of lead or iron about that big around. And when we fire those, they go forward to the infantry. They will go through a man. They will go through the man behind him. They will go through the man behind him. And there are a number of terrible battles that we have fought and that will be fought where case shot is used against the infantry. If they grow even closer, we moved into what is called canister. Those same balls are loaded into a flexible, almost tin can. And when you fire the cannon, they open up right at the muzzle. And what you have is the world's biggest and ugliest shotgun, a terrible, terrible weapon. Now, uh, the ordnance we fire, oh yes. Uh, the five men you see here are responsible for getting off the shot. Now I told you those two men over there at the limber. Their job is to cut fuses. Remember I told you the shot flies out over above the enemy and explodes. Well, we have to control how far that shot flies before it explodes. And they put a fuse in that shell that controls. Do we go for one second, one and a half seconds, two and a half seconds, depending on how far we have to go, and the shell then explodes at the appropriate distance. So it's a very precise job working over there. Now, in addition, there would be, and out of sight today, don't look for them, would be the horse handlers. Now that's a lot more than just standing back there and holding the horses during the battle. You have four or six very big, very strong, very frightened animals back there. You have shot and shell flying in all directions, men screaming orders. And if one of those horses is hit and injured or killed while standing in the traces, you need to get that harness off a dead horse lying on the ground. Put another one in its place or re-rig the harness to work for fewer horses. That is done under battle fuel conditions, high stress, very physically demanding, quite dangerous. And if you cared about your animals, it could be heartbreaking. Now up here at the gun, these five men are charged with actually getting off the shot. Each man has a numbered position and each man has a specific set of duties that they perform. The man standing in position number one is holding a double-ended rammer. Would you hold that up for me, please? That's a double-ended rammer. At one end is solid wood. He uses that to ram the load down to the bottom of the barrel so it can be fired. The wet sponge is used to wash out the barrel after the shot to make sure there are no burning embers still down in there. There's something still burning that gun. You don't want to put gunpowder down there. It could shorten up your day considerably. <laughs> now, when the gun has been loaded, he will place that rammer in an upright position on the hub. If you will do so like that, sir. This is now a secret. You know that maybe a little person next to you doesn't know. Any time you look at a cannon with a rammer in a vertical position on the hub, you are looking at a loaded gun. There's gunpowder in that gun. That is a signal to everyone on the field, no one who dance around in front of this barrel is loaded. The man standing in position three has two small tools that he uses. One of these 
is a vent wire. He will put that down through the vent to puncture the gunpowder load so that it can be ignited. The other is a small vent brush, which he will use to clean out excess carbon in preparation for the next shot. However, this man has one other tool that he uses. It's always best for him to use that tool. That will use that to remove something stuck in the vent. But the other tool he uses is his left thumb, and that's the one he uses to keep us all alive. He will, with his gloves on, presumably during the battle, cover that vent to prevent any air from getting down inside that barrel. That creates a vacuum. You do not want any air in that barrel when you're putting something down there. His job is so essential that nothing goes down that barrel. Not a rammer, not a sponge, not a worm, and certainly not a load of ammunition unless he's right there. And you will hear the crew check with him each and every time to make sure that he is not only there, but that he knows to remain there. Now, the man standing in position four is the one who actually will fire the cannon. He holds in his hand a uh, lanyard, and if you will hold up one of those primers so they can see it. This is what's known as a friction primer. There is a small copper tube containing gunpowder and fulminative mercury, highly flammable and highly explosive. It is attached to a wire. He will insert that in the vent, attach the lanyard to it, spread back from there. You put that uh, primer away from it. Loop that around there. fired and normally will be fired within a few seconds after you see his arm go up. The difference, of course, is this is like cocking a pistol. Pistols go bang. We go boom. Big difference. All right, gentlemen. If you'll now go to post again. Oh, and I'm sorry. This is my powder runner. I'm so sorry. Thank you. And his job is kind of important. This is the man who must keep us constantly supplied with ammunition. He will bring this ammunition forward in a particular way, which I'm going to show you momentarily. And his job is not only to keep us to supply, but to protect the ammunition in here. We'll show you what we mean just in just a second. job of the gunner is to check the aim and elevation of the weapon and then to convey orders from the officers to our men to get all the shot. All right, again, we'll go gunners to post. You notice that these men, if you line up behind him, stand outside the wheels of the gun. Basic training. When these weapons will fire, they will fly back 15 to 12 to 15 feet. Not today. We're only firing a salute. Gunpowder only no projectile. Artillery, every single shot this gun comes back, you've got to roll it and reposition it, load and fire again. Unless you're firing by pool on the wheel, we'll go into that too soon. All right, at this point, I will, with your permission, Captain, load and fire. Now, I do want to let you know if you've not been this close to the gun, it's a little bit loud, but it's not going to break anybody's eardrums. However, if you are a bit nervous, you can always cover your ear. hit these right here and set off our shots, kill the crew, disable the gun. So this man's putting his life at risk to protect that load. You're not going forward to number two. The loading will continue. Notice that two and five also stand with their backs to the enemy, protecting that load. Number 
three. Bet. 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 At this point, the gunner will step forward. I would now sight the weapon. The piece is sighted. Now inserts the fuse. And you're now looking at a loaded and primed weapon. Gun number one is up, sir. Gun number one. Ready! know exactly what to do I do not need to tell you. Now let me ask you something because it's not just a demonstration. We like to send you away with a little bit of knowledge and perhaps something about why we are here with you today. Did you think that gun was kind of loud? Okay. I'd like you to imagine an afternoon like this much hotter, much hotter. And you were outside a little village in Pennsylvania called Gettysburg. It is 1.15 in the afternoon. Blazing heat for two days. Mid. On January, July 1st and July 2nd, almost 200,000 courageous men, north and south, Good clear. have been brutally killing each other by the thousands to determine the direction of this continent. The men of the south are fighting bravely for the liberty of their confederacy. The men of the north are fighting bravely to preserve what they regard as an unbreakable union. All day on the 1st of July, the Confederates chase the Yankees through Gettysburg and have them cornered up on Cemetery Ridge. There are thousands of men already lying dead and bloated in the sun. Horses are dead. Open latrines for 200,000 men and smoke already flying across the field. It is hell on earth. On the 2nd of July, General Lee attaches the other side of the Union line at Little Round Top. Four thousands of men lie dead in the field. out there but men in filth. It is now 1.15 in the afternoon on the third day, July 3rd, and 1.15. Take this gun, make it twice as loud, and multiply it by 300 guns, firing simultaneously for two hours as Lee attempts to drive the Union off the top of Cemetery Ridge. And then, after two hours, becomes one of the most courageous and tragic moments in the history of the entire nation. As 10,000 courageous Confederate soldiers under Generals Pettigrew and Pickett move across one and a half miles of open ground under the fire of artillery like this. It is carnage. They actually continue reforming throughout the charge and they actually reach Cemetery Ridge. At the very top, General Armitage of the Confederate Army with his hat atop a sword, leading his men, lies fallen, and still the men charge on. At this point, a small contingent of North Carolina infantry almost breaches the Union lines. They indeed have broken the Union Army in the city. At the very top, one Union artillery sergeant with a gun like this, holding canister, screams at his men, pull, pull, for God's sake, pull, and he does at Point Blake Ridge. In the high point of our Confederacy, that North Carolina infantry unit simply ceases to exist. It was one of the darkest, and yet in some areas, most courageous moment in our history. It is for those four bearers who define the nation you live in today that we are here to remind you, we encourage you, we urge you, we beg you, open your books, open your minds, and learn more about this thing they call the Civil War because it defines, even today, the nation in which you live. We thank you so much for being with us. God bless you all.